Today, we are going to be discussing some of the tips and tricks we have gained in our past years of robotics that will help you in your future builds. In this section, we will talk about essential tips that, when used correctly, will ensure that your robot functions just the way you want it to. These should be used all year round and apply to all parts of your robot or design challenges. Bearing flats are one of those parts where it is usually better to have them rather than nothing. In this example, we can see that there are two bearing flaps here, which is somewhat unnecessary, but still works and probably reduces some friction. Primarily used where axles rotate, the reason that we use them is to center the axle in the square hole, as seen here, and the hole in the bearing flat is actually circular. This helps to reduce wear and reduce friction on your system. They should be screwed in with 0.5 inch screws and the axle can go through any of the three holes as long as the other two holes have screws in them. That means hypothetically the axle could go through this hole as long as this hole and this hole have screws in them, and vice versa. If the screws are not in both of the remaining holes, the bearing flat will be loose and you will wear out the C-channel until it eventually needs to be replaced. As a general rule of thumb, it is best to use the shortest screw possible and the shortest axle length possible to make sure that everything is space efficient and sturdy. As for axles, most of us have experienced two spur gear slipping or even a sprocket. One of the main reasons that this happens is because an axle that the gear is attached to is so long that it can bend, causing the gears to slip as the distance between them changes. You can notice that in the example that we have here, the gearbox spans from this spot to this spot, and that means that the axle goes across. However, if the gearbox were to be enlarged, say from there to there, the axle would have to span a larger distance meaning that there would be more pressure in the center of the axle where the load is, which means that it would be more prone to bending, which is not what we want. Thus, we want to minimize the length of the axle or screw. Spacing is also extremely important in the midst of all this. If there are too many spacers on an axle, like right here, the motors will quickly burn out due to the friction. However, if there are not enough on the mechanism, the mechanism will move from side to side, making an unstable build, which is also not good. You should try to fill the axle with spacers until there is a little gap at the end of the axle in the C-channel with about an empty space of a sixteenth of an inch to a thirty-second of an inch, just like right here. This is a well-done spacing. This is because that way, although everything can shift over by a sixteenth of an inch to a thirty-second of an inch, there will be minimal friction and the mechanisms will only move an unnoticeable amount. This gearbox is definitely a good example of why it's important to line up your gears. On larger subsystems like fire mechanisms and gearboxes, it is vital to line up the gears so that they have as much contact as possible. This will prevent teeth from chipping away under heavy loads or from stray pieces of metal. Let's see why this gearbox is in danger of chipping. So we can see here that the teeth are not lined up. They are off by about an eighth of an inch. This is problematic because if the lift is under heavy loads, there's a small surface area, only about this small section is in contact with teeth. That means that there is only a small contact area to support a big heavy load. That promotes chipping. Another thing that can promote chipping of gear teeth is stray metal. As this is off by about an eighth of an inch, we can definitely see how this C-channel could hit the, the gear teeth as it rotates. This is definitely not good as it could jam up, burn out, or even break gears and motors. Our tip would be to line up the gears prior to putting spacers in and then filling it up with spacers so that this gap is not there and everything is lined up properly. This is a hard one for teams to decide on. Caps nuts are usually used when something is temporarily built, like a prototype or something that needs to be changed or swapped out often, or on non-finalized builds. Lock nuts, however, are for much more long-term use. These should be on parts of the robot that receive a heavy load or vibration, because caps nuts would simply fall off. Popular places to use a lock nut are on major structural attachments or screw joints. If you do end up making a robot with caps nuts, though, make sure to screw them in tight and use a wrench and check daily for loose screws. Just as a side note, um, I'm graduated and on almost all of my past state robots and world robots, um, I've used almost entirely lock nuts just because they're so much more reliable. As seen in the pictures, 
The bottom picture shows a double reverse 4 bar attached to your chassis. This would be a pretty standard place to use lock nuts just because this is a place where structural stability is really necessary. However, in the top picture, we see lock nuts on bearing flats even, a place where many teams would just use a cups nut. I would suggest using lock nuts on bearing flats as well just because they last longer and they're so much more reliable. However, caps nuts can be used in these applications just to make sure that they're tightened and they're frequently checked to see if they're loose. Wire management. This is considerably one of the most important parts of engineering, but it really isn't everyone's favorite part. But when it's done correctly, it'll make your life much easier and might even be fun to do. We recommend waiting till the majority of your wires are present so that you can group them together and get them close, leave them down all the grooves in the C-channels, and under the robots so they don't get entangled into gears, wheels, and other robots. Zip ties are the best way to organize these wires. Before you strap down with zip ties and call it a day, make sure that you move all the parts of your robot to make sure that none of the wires get crimped or stretched or pinched at any of the joints. If a wire is clearly too short, find another one because it'll be more reliable when testing and computing to use a longer wire. I was always the lead wire management guy on my team, and over the years, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at it. In this example, we could definitely see how wire management is being used really well, but it is with the old Cortex system. However, this still applies. Notice that the wires are run along the edges of the metal just so that nothing has a chance of really getting caught on it and everything is stacked on top of each other instead of entangled so that you can almost follow a wire individually if you wanted to. Another important tip that I've always found is whenever you're attaching a wire upon a straight face, you can go ahead and attach it relatively tightly, and when you're attaching around a joint, keep it loose, move the joint around, make sure that it's not going to get stretched, and then tighten down with a zip tie. Zip ties are used on most robots, and the smallest zip tie size is probably going to be the most useful as well, just because it fits through most VEX holes and is really convenient. The points of contact rule goes for bracing, axles, and screws. Always try to have at least two points of contact. There are moments where screws do not need to go through two points of contact, such as on certain screw joints or other structural pieces. However, on axles especially, always try to have at least two points of contact if you know that this subsystem is going to be carrying a heavy load or needs to work a lot. In this example, we could see the robot called Dreadnought in, in the zone, and it has a very, very heavy lift right here. This heavy lift is almost entirely supported by this axle. Since the axle is under so much load from all the stages of the lift and all the sprocket and chain and metal, it has three points of contact, one here, one here, and one right here in the center of the axle. That's what this C-channel is for. With this extra point of contact, the axle is no longer prone to bending as it has much support right where it needs it. We would like to reiterate that these tips and tricks should be a good start to building high quality robots. Using these strategies in combination with the golden rule of X though, makes a well-designed and structurally competitive robot guaranteed. We'd also like to say that you should be creative. Don't limit yourself to only the tips that we've given or the tricks that we've given. Try and make things that are better. This is just meant to be a baseline. The sky's the limit in terms of innovation here. Thanks for watching.